Father God, thank you that we can meet together this evening um, from all sorts of different places, not just around the UK, but across the world. And Lord, would you bless us now and would you help us really uh, listen well and engage well as Beth shares? Would you speak clearly through her and um, would it be really encouraging to us all? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, thanks. Well, I'll, um, I'll just kind of jump in and tell you a little bit about me. So I am in Southampton usually, but right now I'm in Scotland. I'm visiting some um, NAVS contacts that I was in Norway with um, some years ago. So I am in Claire Donahue's bedroom, for those of you that know her. Um, and she has people meeting in her lounge, um, other NAVS people. So um, multiple events going on right now. Um, I teach uh, creative writing at a university in the US um, most of the time. And as you've heard a few times, my, my exciting life news is that I'm marrying uh, Jim Wilder. Um, so I'm very eager to do that. So He's a very lucky man, I think. Oh, thanks, I feel pretty lucky too. Um, so, um, and when he proposed to me, um, I'll mention this uh, briefly, uh, uh, where he was planning to propose to me, a bird pooped on his head. Um, and so uh, I had to clean him up and then he did not get to propose there. So we had a, had a somewhat strange proposal experience. So um, on the bridge that he was planning to propose didn't work out. Um, so I've been engaged for just like a month now, a month and a day, I think, or we've been engaged. So, um, okay, so that, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually going to have you think just for a minute um, about a question, um, and we'll we might we might break into small groups later, or maybe we won't because we're a pretty small group. So the question that I'd like you to think about is: Has your life ever looked differently than you dreamed? So can you think of a time where your life has looked differently than you dreamed? I'll just give everybody a minute or two. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking, the title of the talk is Using Our Resources for God, something like that. Um, but I'd like to add a subtitle, like Trusting His Better Dreams for Life. Um, so we'll be talking about resources, but not only resources. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about a woman in the Bible named Lydia, who I um, hate to say I knew almost nothing about before I prepared for this talk. So um, Steve said, would you be interested in talking about Lydia? And I said, yeah, actually I would, since I don't know anything about her. Um, I knew just like a couple facts and that was it. Um, so I've been reading about her for a few weeks and it's been fascinating. Um, so, but before we get to her though, we're gonna talk about um, the Bible writer, Paul. So Paul had a dream um, and um, Paul's life had been radically transformed by Jesus. And he wanted to go tell people about it. And one of the places that he wanted to go was Asia. Um, but something kept getting in the way of his dream. So we're going to be mostly in Acts 16 tonight. So if you have a Bible, you could turn there. Otherwise, I will read the passages too, okay? So Acts 16. Um, so I'm just going to start in verse 6, okay? So Paul and his companions, Jim could probably tell me that how these are supposed to be pronounced. I don't really know, but Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the board of Mysia, they, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Um, so I read this and I thought, where in the world are these places? Um, I have no idea. I don't know very much about kind of um, like ancient Bible places um, or the sort of provinces of Asia or any of that. So I'm going to show you a map. I, I call Stephen Hart or Stephen Hartwell, Mr. Map. Um, so maybe he, he would have been a better mapper here, but I found a, um, a map that I'd like to show you. Okay. Can you guys see that? Is that clear for everybody? The map, map on, can somebody give me a thumbs up maybe? Okay, all right, thanks Jess. Okay. So if you look back at those titles that I just read kind of badly, um, basically Paul is going to all of these places that are surrounding Asia. So he's trying to get into Asia. So he tries one place, it doesn't work. 
He tries another place, it doesn't work. He tries another place, it doesn't work. So he's just attempting over and over to get into Asia. Um, I didn't really realize until I looked at the map that he was kind of going great distances to try to get into Asia. Um, so he was very keen on this idea of, um, of sort of, you know, talking to people about Jesus in Asia, um, particularly. So that was his dream. Um, and okay, I'm gonna stop, stop screen sharing here, but um, his dream was to go to Asia. So we have this dream of Paul's, um, but Paul at every turn was stopped. So his dream just didn't seem to happen. Um, and I don't, you know, we don't know how Paul felt about that exactly, but I would imagine he felt frustrated. Um, and that I think is often how we feel when our dreams are thwarted. Um, things that we think are good and from God um, just don't happen. Um, so what happens next in the story of Paul and in um, Acts 16? So God gives Paul a literal dream. So that was kind of a figurative dream, a dream as in what you really want to happen and desire. Um, and this dream is called the dream of the man of Macedonia. Um, so where is Macedonia? I'm going to screen share again here for a second. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to share the same, same section. Um, where is Macedonia? Um, can you guys see it over to the left of Asia? It's not in Asia. So that's the key. So Macedonia is not in Asia. So he has a dream of meeting a man from Macedonia. Um, it's in Europe. Um, uh, so the dream is not in Asia. All right. So I'm going to just read again, starting in verse eight. Okay. So they've passed Mesia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul had seen the vision. We got ready or after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. Okay, so Paul's had this dream of Asia, doesn't happen. There's, God seems to redirect him through another dream, a literal dream. And so he follows and he says, okay, I will go to Macedonia. So the first kind of part one of this little talk is when God's dreams look different than we imagined. Okay. So we have God's dream looking different than Paul imagined. He imagined that he would find himself in Asia and instead he's finding himself in a very different place. Um, so as I was thinking about my life, I thought of a couple examples um, where things turned out or my dreams looked very different than I imagined. Um, so first, um, the first one is, was related to career and the second one was related to relationships. So that's why it's nice you can um, meet Mr. James Wilder here at the beginning. Um, so I became a Christian at a wilderness camp when I was 15. So I always had this dream and plan for my life um, that once I got out of college, I would probably get married and then work at a Christian camp. That's what I was going to do. So I worked at a Christian camp every summer and winter break. Um, I did like, I learned all these camping skills. I went to like all these classes on rock climbing and um, canoeing. I became like a master canoeist and did all this kind of stuff, planning to be working at this Christian camp. In fact, I even flew to Colorado and I was in high school. So I was about 18, maybe 17. And, um, had a meeting with the director of Christian Camping International. Um, I was pretty serious. I really wanted to like go to the source and figure this out. Um, and so that was my plan. Um, uh, but uh, things did not turn out that way for me. Um, so I'm gonna tell you in a little bit how they turned out for me. Um, I did not end up in Christian camping as is clear from the fact that I introduced myself as a creative writing professor. Um, and um, I did not end up getting married at 22 or 23, as is clear by the fact that I am currently engaged and I'm 40. So, um, so things shifted a little bit. So I had two questions that I thought we could talk about. Maybe we could just split the group in half. Is that possible, Steve? Are you 
Are you controlling this? Uh, Stephen Hartwell is in charge right. of groups. Stephen Hartwell, could you do that? that sounds good. Um, there's two questions I have, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have them on a PowerPoint or anything, but maybe you could write them down. Um, so first question, um, why do you think God let Paul have the dream of Asia if he wasn't going to go there? Um, and I don't necessarily have an answer for either of these questions. I'm just posing them, okay? So why do you think God let Paul have the dream of Asia if he wasn't going to go there? There's this kind of idea in American Christian culture, I don't know if it's the same in English culture or not, that God gives you your dreams, that the dreams that you have are all God-given and they somehow direct your path. Um, and it's kind of a John Eldridge kind of idea. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He wrote this book, Wild at Heart, but he also wrote this other book called Journey of Desire, which got really big in the US for a while. Um, and the idea was that we're led primarily by our desires, which are God-given and good. Um, but here we have a desire um, that is not being fulfilled. So why do you think God let Paul have the dream of Asia if he wasn't going to go there? And then the second question I have is the one that we talked that you've been thinking about. So had your life ever looked different than you dreamed? Okay. So I just think we'll just maybe take five, five minutes. We're not going to take a long time with these, but just a couple of minutes. So Stephen, do you mind just um, apologize? So I was trying to close the, uh, the button and uh, we're missing Stephen Hartwell here. It always takes him a bit longer in Zoom world. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't yeah. know how to say that. <laughs> Some Doctor Who thing, he's gone back in time. <laughs> something like that okay all right thanks everybody okay um so i i told you that i finished the kind of telling you a little bit um about me so i had this dream of being in a christian camp getting married early um so i actually enrolled in a graduate program for christian camping something that we ha happened to have in the u.s at a Wheaton College. Um, and uh, two, two weeks after I started, um, they closed the program down. So I had just gotten there and I was like, no, um, what in the world? And so suddenly there was no program from Christian camping. Um, so I found myself like, well, what am I going to do now? So I was just taking these random classes, like creative writing, for instance. Um, I took a series of random courses because I had no idea what to do with my time um, because suddenly all of us that were in this Christian camping program, and there were like 30 of us, were in no program. We were just left to try to figure out what we wanted to do. Um, so that summer I had a job leading wilderness trips, Christian camping. You know, I got back to the camp at least. Um, and my trip partner is a guy named John. Um, and partway through the summer, he asked me a question. He said, have you ever thought about doing something other than Christian camping, like maybe going overseas? Um, and I said, no, <laughs> I have not and I don't want to. And so he said, well, why don't you pray about it and just say, God, if you want to send me. I said, okay, I'll pray about it. But I felt very confident in my dream and plan. Um, so uh, that day I went and sat in the middle of the river where we were kind of leading these canoe trips on a rock. And I, and I said, okay, God, if you want me to do something else, if you maybe want me to go overseas, um, uh, please let me know. Um, and I felt the clearest I've ever heard God in my life. A uh, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, I, 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 this is, this is a turn, quite a, quite a shift. I did not plan to have a yes in that moment. So I was suddenly was thinking, oh no, what am I going to do with this? And what am I going to tell John, you know, after, after all of this? So we'll, we'll kind of come back to the story, a little bit of me in a little bit, but, um, things turned for me. So part one, we talked about when God's dreams look different than we imagined. Part two is when God's people look different than we imagined. So Paul gets to Macedonia, city of Philippi. You know, we've all probably heard of that from Philippians. Um, Paul's strategy is usually to go into Jewish temples and tell Jews about Jesus. This is what he often does. 
Um, Paul was a Jew himself. So this was a familiar way to work. Um, he was used to meeting people this way and connecting with them. Um, but when Paul walked through the city gate, there was an inscription on the gate, um, historians say, and the inscription said, um, basically, um, no new religions welcome in the city. And so um, there was a rule against bringing other religions into the city of Philippi. Um, so not only that, so Paul walks through this gate and immediately there's this kind of discouraging thing. And not only that, but actually there's no synagogue. Um, Jewish law says that in order for there to be a synagogue, um, there has to be at least 10 Jewish men in a city. So there are not 10 Jewish men there. So he's gone to this huge city and there are less than 10 Jewish men. So his normal strategy isn't really going to cut it. Um, so we'll keep reading. So starting in verse 13, so we're still in chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God, um, this meaning Jewish, um, or had converted to Judaism actually. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Um, it's a bit, a bit of an aggressive persuasion at the end. If you think I'm a Christian, come. Um, so that, that's kind of the persuasion she makes. Um, so this is really different than what Paul expected. First of all, his dream was that he was going to meet a, a man from Macedonia. So he gets to Macedonia. There's no guys. Um, instead, he meets a group of women. Um, and a lot of these women aren't even Jewish. So they're like converts to Judaism. Um, and so this is a bit of an odd scenario for him. Actually in the Talmud, um, a famous rabbi had said, and this was said actually before Paul, um, better that the words of law, the law be burned than entrusted to a woman. So there is a really strong sense of like, women don't get it. We do not go to the women. Um, and so the women were like outlawed um, from learning the scriptures, which is really interesting um, at that time. So it was only um, the men. So here are all these women by themselves by a river. Um, and uh, I did some sort of looking more geography things. And the river where they're meeting was about two and a half kilometers from the city. It's a long way away. Um, so the reason that they were going to this river um, is because um, Jews had to ceremon ceremonially cleanse their hands, their feet, and their faces um, when they prayed. And so these women were pretty devout. So they're there on the Sabbath, and they are praying, and they are ceremonially cleansing their hands, feet, and, feet and face. So somebody had told Paul, there's this group of women. Um, you can find them outside the city by the river. So um, pretty different than Paul's dream. Um, but a few other things. We don't know that much about Lydia. So you see in this section, there's only one person who, who comes to Jesus, right? And her name is Lydia. So out of all the women that he talks to, um, Lydia is interested, um, but only Lydia. So no man, none of the other ladies, just this one, one woman. So getting back to this kind of idea, um, sometimes God's people look different than we imagined. So what do we know about Lydia? Like I said at the beginning of this, I didn't know much about her before I started doing, um, doing some studies. So I'm just curious, what do you guys know about Lydia? Is there any kind of background you know about her that we could kind of feed in together? You can just jump in, anybody. Is it right that the <coughs> trading in purple cloth implies a certain level of wealth and sophistication? Yep, yep, definitely. She was a trader in purple cloth. So purple cloth was only um, sold to nobles at that time. Um, but um, Philippi had a lot of nobles. And so this was like, uh, kind of, it made sense for her to be in Philippi. So this is not where the, the purple cloth was made. Um, it was made in Thyatira, where she was from. And yeah, Taz, thanks. Purple is ex was extremely expensive at the time, for sure. So sold to the elites, super expensive. Um, so we know that she is at least middle class, um, if not more. 
Um, anything else we know about her or could gather about her from the section? So she came from Thyatira? Yep, so she came from Thyatira. Which is not in the same area, I think. Nope, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, where Thyatira is. Um, she came from Thyatira, which also has another name, which I'll explain to you a little bit later too. Do we notice a lack of someone else being mentioned that usually would be mentioned in those days? No husband mentioned? No husband mentioned, okay? So she's probably a widow, um, which is interesting. So widows, um, I was, I found myself reading a lot of like sort of obscure Jewish law from way, way back when I was preparing for this. Widows could continue their husband's business. So they could take it over. So this was likely her husband's business at one point and he had died. Um, and so she could take it over and run the household. So um, she's not from Philippi. Where is she from? Um, she, as Steve said, is from Thyatira. So let me show you that. We're gonna go back to the another map here, okay? Um, the same map, actually. Um, oh, I guess it doesn't show it in this map. So Thyatira is in Asia, um, which is pretty interesting. So Paul has wanted to go to Asia very badly. Um, and instead he ends up in Macedonia meeting a woman from Asia. Um, so kind of intriguing. Um, and Thyatira has another name. Does anybody know what Thyatira's other name is? This was really interesting to me. We'll get into what it might mean later, but anybody ever heard this? It was also called Lydia. So um, we have Lydia from Lydia. Um, that is the, the woman that we have, which it, it's important her name, her name kind of matters. Names mattered a lot in Jewish culture. So if it would be like Steve McClure being named Southampton and, um, and Jim Wilder being named Ohio. Um, so it kind of, kind of strange. Um, so we have this kind of weird, weird name. In fact, lots of Bible commentators have like mused about this. Like what was happening with the name? Like, why was she named after this place? So there, there have been a few different theories of it. Um, okay. What else do we know about her? We know she's converted to Judaism and she's so devoted that she goes on a work day to pray. So um, in Philippi, people work seven days a week. You made a lot of money on Saturdays, um, which is interesting, but she's not doing that. Instead of working, she is going to pray. So this is not what Paul imagined when he dreamed of Macedonia or Asia, an Asian woman living somewhere else who's a convert to another faith. But the thing is, she is hungry for God. So we can see in that passage, I'll just go back to it for a minute. Um, she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So she immediately offers, offers up her resources um, to these guys, right? She offers up her home, um, her food. She has her whole household baptized. Um, she offers hospitality. So um, that's what she's often talked about in terms of hospitality. Um, the Lifeway commentary mentioned, and I, I hadn't really thought about this, as an English professor, you would think I would, um, but the root of the word hospitality is hospital. So hospitality, like a hospital, is a place where people should find mental, spiritual, emotional safety and healing. So, um, so Lydia not only offers this, but she persuades um, Paul and his friends to come. So she's really eager to offer what she has. Um, so going back to the kind of title of the talk, she gives all her resources. She's, she says, you know, here's what I have. Um, thanks to us, hospies. Um, so we have, can you tell us about that, hospies? Um, oh, the word okay. Yeah, Latin, um, hospital comes from, in turn from Latin, Latin hospice, her, so that's actually okay. the hospitality there. Okay, that's, yeah, helpful, Good thank person. you. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. That's great. So, okay. So we've got this hospitality hospital. She invites these people in, hospies. Um, and, um, but this is actually not the only time she invites people in. We're not going to read this section because it's a bit long, but later in the same chapter, all sorts of crazy things start happening to Paul. He's falsely imprisoned. He, um, there's an earthquake. Um, he leads a jailer to Jesus and then he's free. Um, and, but he's kind of on the run, he and his friends, because they might get um, put in prison again. So Paul is trying to think about where should I go? Um, where do my friends and I go? And the first thing he thinks is Lydia's. Let's go to Lydia's. Um, we will be safe there. Um, so her home is a safe place for them, which is kind of risky, right? Um, these guys that have just freed themselves from prison, God has freed them from prison, um, are now hiding out in her house. So her hospitality has gone from like offering, you know, a, a bed and a nice meal to offering like a, a hideaway um, for, for con ex-cons. Um, so uh, that's part of it. Um, but even more happens. So um, we understand because there is a book of Philippians um, that there is a church in Philippi. So this church starts in Lydia's house, okay? Um, so if you remember the inscription on the city gate, the description on the city gate said there were to be no new religions in Philippi. So this is another risky move she's making. So in her hospitality, she's she's willing to risk. Um, she's willing to have people come to her house to have a church start there. Um, and this is pretty interesting. Um, she's, she's willing to be used by God. I, I think some of us sometimes, or maybe I'm just talking about myself, but some of us um, stop moves of God because we don't consider people the right people for the job. And I think sometimes we don't consider ourselves the right people for the job. Um, and so I would say that happens pretty often too. And so we stop ourselves from being used by God. But Lydia doesn't do that. Um, it's, so I'm going to go back to her name a little bit. So it, it's interesting and surprising that her name is Lydia because she's from Lydia. It's the name of the town where she's from. Um, Thyatira is called Lydia. Um, and names are really tied into identities then. So her identity when she was named was just that place. That's it. So her identity is like, here's Lydia, and she's just really tied to this place. This is where she's from. This is this place is her place. Um, uh, but that didn't stop her. Um, she didn't think, I'm just a woman. I'm just from Lydia. My identity is here. She's willing to risk a lot. Um, and even though she's not the person that Paul expected, um, she's willing to kind of move in um, and kind of, you know, see what God will do. So um, I have two more questions um, for you guys. This is actually the only the second, the group, second group time, but it'll be our last group time. Maybe we'll pray a little bit at the end with our groups, but um, do you have any resources you could think you can think of that you could use for God? So that's the first one. Any resources you think of that you could use for God? Maybe surprising ones. Um, and then is there anyone the church tends to overlook as unlikely to be used by God? So at that point, the church tended to overlook women um, and it tended to overlook foreigners um, as being used by God. Um, so is there anyone today you would say the church tends to overlook? So first question, any resources you think of that either you or we collectively um, could, you know, could be used by God or, and then any, anyone the church tends to overlook um, as being used by God. So let's just take five minutes. So Stephen, if you don't mind bouncing us into groups for five minutes. Part one, we talked about when God's dreams look different than when, what we imagined. Part two, when God's people look different than we imagined. And part three, I want to mention that God moves in ways that are beyond what we imagined with those first two parts. Okay. So um, back to my story for a little bit, and then we'll return to Paul and Lydia. Um, uh, I was unlikely for going overseas um, or doing something other than Christian camping. Um, I had never taught. I didn't speak any other languages besides English, and I wasn't particularly good at learning languages. Um, I could speak a tiny bit of Spanish, and that was it. Um, the only ministry I really knew how to be involved with was camp. 
Um, I had never traveled by myself um, and I didn't have any money. Um, so I was in graduate school. So I was poor. So it's kind of like, huh, I don't really have many things that seem like the, the kind of ideal for going and doing something, something else. Um, but I think even more than that, I had heard messages for a long time in my life that, that were, that I wasn't really enough to be used by God, that, 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 that sometimes comes up too. So I had that sense in my head, you know, that, ah, what I have isn't enough. Um, you know, God uses certain people that are really well equipped and they have all the knowledge and the skills and et cetera. Um, uh, but God moved in my life. So I ended up, um, applying, um, that next summer to, um, get, uh, three different trips. And, um, some of you probably heard this story before. One was to Norway and Latvia with the navigators, including Stephen Clerk. Um, one was a trip to Africa. And then, um, one was to Eastern Europe. It might've even been the Ukraine, but I can't recall. Um, so the people in Africa said, our trip is full. They were going for like five months, but our son, um, Daryl, um, is leading this trip to Norway and Latvia. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I've already applied for a trip to Norway and Latvia. And then the um, Eastern European people said, um, we're gonna have to cancel our trip because you're the only person that was interested. But we have some friends that are leading a trip to Norway and Latvia. And these were di three different mission organizations. I just, I had no idea what God wanted me to do. So I just like put out, like, like put feelers out with like Campus Crusade and Navigators and some other mission organization. So, but all of them ended back up in Norway and Latvia. So it was pretty intriguing that God, like all roads kind of led to Norway and Latvia, which was unexpected for me. <laughs> it's and always the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, um, but I would say, so I got involved with the Navigators then, and it changed my life and my priorities really radically. Um, so I learned about discipleship, um, which I didn't know that much about before, and um, learned that I loved working with students, um, students in Europe, um, Latvia first, but then other places too. Um, and God gave me really deep friendships and wonderful community and all these things that I would not have expected. I had no idea that that was going to happen. You know, some of the best ministry, um, best mentors, including Jez and Steve on this call. And, um, and like he, he wanted to work in my life and, you know, develop all these things. And, um, and then lo and behold, the Norway part of the, um, kind of program, was wilderness stuff. So it's interesting that I found myself not at a Christian camp, but involved in wilderness stuff. So God, God moved. And then the other thing, the other desire that I had talked about that didn't happen when I was 22 um, was getting married. And so at 40 this year, I am getting married. So it's not what I, not the timing I would have imagined. Um, and the interim kind of in those years was harder than I imagined and had more suffering than I wished, um, but God, um, God had better dreams than what my dreams were. So I think back and think, what if I had married the guy that I was dating at 22? Well, he's not a Christian anymore. So that's pretty interesting. So he, he lives abroad. So maybe I'd be abroad somewhere, but, um, he's not, he's not following Jesus. So, um, interesting to kind of see what, what happened and how things turned out. So, um, what happens with Lydia? I'm just going to kind of finish with this and then we'll have a little time to pray. So um, with Lydia, the first church begins in Europe. So um, Macedonia is in Europe. So that was the, the very first church in Europe. We know this because the letter of Philippians mentions the church. Um, so that's the first thing that happens. Another thing that happens is Paul and his companions see a new way of doing ministry. Um, so they suddenly think, oh, we can do ministry. We don't have to just do it the way that we have been doing it. So they broaden out how they're doing ministry. And you see that in subsequent, um, ministry, um, uh, sort of discussions of their ministry throughout the scriptures. Um, they're also given a safe haven of rest. Um, Lydia is saved and used by God. Our own churches and ministries in Europe spring from this. So Lydia's was the first. 
um, which is pretty interesting. So this woman that I'd never, never knew anything about um, was like the first church planter, the church, first church in Europe. Um, but one other really cool thing happened. Um, and this, um, we don't actually see until the book of Revelation. So in the book of Revelation, there's mentioned a church in Thyatira, um, a church in Lydia. Um, so how did the church in Thyatira spring up? Well, no one knows for sure, but almost all Bible commentators um, speculate that Lydia eventually went home, left Philippi when her trading was done and started a church there. So kind of interesting that Paul has this vision for Asia. Um, that's where he wants to go. Um, and he's you know desperate to go to Asia and the Holy Spirit stops him um, over and over again. Um, but lo and behold, when he meets this Asian woman in Europe, um, both churches start in both Asia and Europe. And so it's like God is doing something even bigger than um, Paul could have ever dreamed or imagined. So that kind of no, that closed door from God, um, opened doors in two continents um, for uh, people to come to know him. So um, I just kind of wanted to mention that, that because I thought that that was, for me, really intriguing and helpful to see that like, oh, God was working, even, even though um, the dream, Paul's dream didn't work out how he thought. So again, I, I think like when we are open to using whatever resources we have for God, um, he'll multiply them, you know, and sometimes he changes the dreams and he pivots. So if Paul had seen a dream of a woman from Asia, would he have gone to Macedonia? Probably not. Um, he probably would not have. So God gives him a dream of a Macedonian man. Um, and then he uses that to, you know, work in both Europe and Asia. So, um, so that's it for me, but I thought perhaps we could just pray a little bit in our groups and then be done. Um, and just pray for a few minutes about, um, well, we can pray about whatever, whatever you guys would like to, but maybe in part about, um, the dreams that God has for us, um, and what he's doing in the church in Europe. <laughs> 